What I want to do briefly is just digress and talk about non cycling investment. You know, a few years ago, three or four years ago, four or five years ago, I personally had the belief that the time had come when non seismic methods, gravity, magnetic, electromagnetic methods, would take their place in the suite of geophysical techniques that subsurface folk used a lot and explorers used routinely. You only have to look at the market's commentary on non seismic geophysical entities to know that that has not come to pass. Um, the market in two ways. First of all, you can buy the shares of pure EM companies at about a tenth of the price you would have had to pay for them two years ago. Secondly, and of course the reason for the first point, is that um, the revenues anticipated by these companies at the times they floated are pretty well 20 or 25% of what they anticipated. And this is at a time when oil prices are stunningly high, activity is stunningly high, everybody is scrambling to explore every good basin, every nasty little basin that they can see. So the important message there that non-seismic techniques are falling into this, well, what is the Colorado River? And the point, therefore, is that, getting back, getting back to my description of fourth genera generation seismic, clearly encompasses that package, a lot of which we'll hear about today. Fourth generation geophysics, I guess I'm inferring or stating quite boldly, consists only of seismic. And as um, I guess the gentlemen such as Laplace and James Clark Maxwell and uh, Sir Pritz who wrote down the fundamental equ equations 150, 140 years ago, I mean what we know is seismic is king and we are seeing the evidence of that in the technology that's being brought forward. I'd like to finish with one comment which was uh, or one other small story which uh, Keith Nunn, who's sitting in the audience, will remember. Uh, our first boss at BP um, in about 1980 advised us that if we had $100 to spend on uh, geophysics, spend $99 on seismic and the other dollar on a good cup of coffee. Uh, this morning, ladies and gentlemen, the coffee is free and the lunch is free. Um, and with that, We'll move over to our main agenda. Um, you all should have a copy of the agenda in front of you. Um, our first talk is from uh, CGG Veritas on uh, wide azimuth, not just for the Gulf of Mexico. And I invite uh, Roger Taylor to, to lead off this morning. Thank you. Roger Taylor, I'm with CPD Veritas in the technical marketing department. So, I guess my motive for being here today is to tell you that Wyatt Azimuth has escaped from the valley of death and is uh, alive and kicking. So, let's have a look at the title, um, Wyatt Azimuth, not just the Gulf of Mexico. So, why should they have all the fun over in the Gulf of Mexico with this fancy Wyatt Azimuth? Uh, did they invent it? No. So the truth is, is that us, the rest of the world, have had wide azimuth for, for years. We've used it on shore and land surveys. We've used it uh, in the ocean bottom, with, uh, ocean bottom seismic. So perhaps, really, what we should be looking at saying is something more like benefiting from the recent mass developments in the Gulf of Mexico. But in addition to that, we've seen developments in the Middle East and North Africa for land seismic. So just to include them and the rest of the world. So this is my overview for the talk today. Um, I'm going to show you the proven benefits of WAS, 
because it, is, it has made it out of the valley of death. It is a valuable tool. And we're going to have a look at why that's an action in marine land and processing. And I'll conclude. So, worldwide challenges for exploration and for seismic. Well, they have the problems in the Gulf of Mexico with uh, salt, but uh, we have our problems as well. We have salt, we have basalt, we have unconformities around the world that creates uh, illumination problems. We have some areas of outstanding uh, multiple uh, complexity. Um, Rugo sea bottoms, carbonates, things like that. These are challenges that wide azimuth can tackle. And also, something that people perhaps uh, forget to uh, talk about um, in the context of wide azimuth is fracture characterization. <coughs> wide azimuth data is very well suited for doing that. So we also have these naturally fractured reservoirs we can deploy wide azimuth for. So let's look at the proven benefits of wide azimuth. And there's three main points here. Uh, we have improved wave field sampling. We have improved illumination and improved multiple attenuation. And these three things combine to give us these kind of images that we used to see now. So this is um, an image from the first wide azimuth tow streamer survey in the Gulf of Mexico, which seems to be very task quite a BP. So this is over Mad Dog. And you can see the comparison between the narrow azimuth and the wide azimuth seismic there. And where the uh, narrow azimuth struggles to reveal anything subsol, it all becomes clear with wide azimuth. And the reason for that, those three points we've listed above. So let's do a, uh, a conceptual seismic experiment here. So we have a source, and we have receivers. We set the source off, and it radiates energy down the subsurface. And with narrow azimuth, we acquire just a small part of that wave field as it returns from the subsurface. With wide azimuth, we capture a much larger chunk of it. So the point being that wide azimuth, in effect, gives us a larger antenna. You can think of it in terms of radio astronomy or some other analogy like that. So this captures more of the 3D seismic wave field, provides us with better illumination. Um, one point that wasn't clear from that diagram is sampling. And sampling, as ever, is important. So what we want is dense sampling. We want to make sure we don't have any aliasing. And this will allow us to provide improved discrimination between signal and noise, and improve the resolution of the images that we can get. So that's way for the sampling. The second point, illumination. So it's one of many examples that you can see in the uh, industry press of a subsurface target <coughs> illuminated by two 3D surveys, narrow azimuth 3D surveys, uh, shot in different directions. <coughs> I mean, these images are different, so which one's right? Well, the synthetic from, synthetic from Chevron goes the way to explaining this. So here we have a salt body, and we have, again, we have this orthogonal 3D narrow azimuth acquisition, one in the dip direction, one in the strike direction, and these are the resulting images. Again, very different. But now I change the shooting geometry and acquire a synthetic wide azimuth data set along the dip and strike directions. You now see that these images are starting to converge, they're becoming more similar. And in addition, we see that we, we've cleared up all of that messy kind of multiple energy. So that's interesting. So what's the solution? Obviously we need to acquire all azimuths and all offsets to get the optimum image. But where as that is impractical, we can at least try and improve our offset azimuth coverage with a wide azimuth geometry.